Church, let me invite you to take your Bible today and turn to the book of Luke. This morning's text comes from Luke chapter 2, verses 22 to 38. Continuing in our study of the gospel according to Luke, we are still looking at the earliest days of Christ's life together. Luke chapter 2, verses 22 to 38 is our text for this, this afternoon. With God's help, let's now turn our hearts to hear his word together. Luke chapter two, beginning verse 22. And when the time came for their purification according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who first opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in the spirit into the temple and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. And his father and his mother marveled at what was said about him. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign that is opposed and a sword will pierce through your own soul also so that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. And there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was advanced in years, having lived with her husband seven years from the time when she was a virgin, and then as a widow until she was 84. She did not depart from the temple, worshiping with fasting and prayer night and day, And coming up at that very hour, she began to give thanks to God and to speak of him to all who were waiting for the redemption of of Jerusalem. So we come now to the two final reactions Luke records for us to the birth of Jesus Christ. This time we are in Jerusalem. We're, We're at the temple. And you may have noticed along the way that older godly saints have figured rather large in this story. There's this pattern of men and women who are described plainly as old, advanced in years, ready to depart. So you have this this whole kind of seniors ministry going on in just the first couple of chapters as they proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. First you have Zechariah and Elizabeth. Now we're looking at Simeon and Anna, uh, two individuals whose witnesses are both connected to this idea of waiting. Simeon, the scripture says, is waiting for the consolation of Israel. Anna is a prophetess. She speaks of Christ to all who are waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. And it's into into this atmosphere of anticipation and eagerness and hope about the redemptive purposes of God that we find Joseph and Mary bringing the Christ child into Jerusalem, right into the temple precincts. We might think to ourselves, we might ask, well, why Simeon? Why Anna? Why does Luke draw our attention to them? These are otherwise unknown individuals. What purpose do they serve in the narrative? I want to remind you of what Luke says about his purpose statement back at the very beginning of this book. 
He sets this out at the very beginning, the very first chapter. He said that just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word, just as others have delivered these things that have been accomplished among us, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may have, you remember the word? Certainty that you may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. Brothers and sisters, what lends certainty? There are any number of things that we could mention, but one is witnesses, eyewitnesses, firsthand testimony. Under the law and the old covenant, in fact, this is true under the new covenant within the church, you had to have two or more witnesses for any charge to be established. And you could almost look at this passage as Luke taking that principle and turning it on its head and using it in a positive sense. Positively speaking, it's almost as if he says, here you have two highly reliable, credible witnesses in this orderly account. And he highlights their faithfulness, their single-mindedness, the Spirit's work in their lives, even the fact that they are up in years. That signals the fact here are two individuals that are worthy of our attention. They're worthy of our respect. But more than anything, they're devout. They are devoted to God. They're devoted to the things of God. And it is by linking this devotion with their recognition of Jesus as the Messiah that Luke is saying, here is yet another reason that you can have certainty concerning the things that have been accomplished. Here's a reason you can have certainty concerning the fact that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, the promised one sent from above. It's for the same reasons that Simeon and Anna both stand as exemplary models for every single one of us here today in terms of the reaction needy sinners ought to have to the good news of Jesus Christ. They exemplify the kind of devotion and service and godly fear and just sheer delight in the Lord that we are called to cultivate within our own lives as the people of God. Now, before we look at Simeon and Anna, uh, respectively, I want you to look at the backdrop that Luke sets for us in verses 22 to 24. Uh, We already know that Jesus has been circumcised at the end of eight days. Well, now, 40 days after his birth, the time comes for purification according to the law of Moses. And just notice that phrase in the scriptures here. Three times in three, for, three verses, the centrality of the word of God, the centrality of the law of God is reinforced according to the law, as it is written, the law of the Lord. What is Luke saying? Everything is being done just as it should be. Mary has gone through this time of ceremonial cleansing. They have come to present Jesus at the temple. They have come to offer a sacrifice. It talks about a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now, what Luke doesn't say here is just as important as what he does says. If you are familiar with the book of Leviticus, that that book that you may find yourself kind of glossing over a little bit if you go through an annual Bible reading program, you may know that er, early on in, in Leviticus chapter 12, don't turn there now, but you may know that whenever you had a son or a daughter, the prescription in terms of the sacrifice that was to be offered was a lamb, a year old for a burnt offering and a pigeon or a turtle dove for a sin offering. You can read about that more later. Leviticus chapter 12. That was the ordinary expectation. But that's not not all uh, that there is to be said about this. If you keep reading in that passage, speaking about the mother, Moses says, and if she cannot afford a lamb, 
Then she shall take two turtle doves or two pigeons, one for a burnt offering and the other for a sin offering. So why does Luke tell us that they brought two turtle doves or two pigeons? He doesn't offer any commentary on it, does he? But in a, in a roundabout kind of way, Luke continues to underscore this fact that, that Jesus was not born into a household that had power and money and prestige going for him. He was a part of the humble poor. He didn't have all of these resources at his disposal. Joseph and Mary cannot afford a lamb. This is right in keeping with the whole story that we have been tracing thus far. Jesus is part of a poor family. Neither does Luke mention the five shekel offering that you would ordinarily find certainly among such devout parents. That's what the law required to give as the ransom price for the firstborn son. Now we have talked and seen already about what a scrupulous uh, writer Luke is, how, how careful he is and how much attention he gives to, to detail. And the fact that we see how everything else is here, everything is done according to the requirements of the law. They attend to all of those things. Luke seems to be at pains to make that point, And yet the text is silent on this fact that may suggest that rather than Jesus being ransomed by Joseph and Mary for those five shekels, he has in fact been consecrated to the Lord in the same way that Hannah does in uh, 1 Samuel chapter two, when she offers her son Samuel uh, to the Lord's service and she says, I have lent him to the Lord. It won't be very long before we're going to hear uh, Jesus talking about how he must be about his father's business, not talking about his father Joseph, but about his heavenly father, or talking about my house, not talking about home back in Nazareth, but about the temple. He's dedicated to his heavenly father. Now, turn your attention with me to Simeon in verse 25. I'll read that again. It says, now there was a man in in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was righteous and devout waiting for the consolation of Israel and the Holy Spirit was upon him and it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Church, here is a a man who is totally committed to the things of God. He, as, as we say sometimes, is sold out to the things of God. He trusts in the promise of God's word. He is walking in obedience to the command of God. The whole orientation of this man's life is directed and constrained by the promises of God, by the very word of God. What the Lord has revealed of himself and of his saving purposes within the world. Simeon has confidence that the promises God has spoken by his very own mouth will come to pass and you can see that in his life you can see that in the way that he discharges his whole calling as one who belongs to the Lord now of course this is partly informed it is buttressed even further by this special revelation that the Holy Spirit had given him that he wouldn't see death until the coming of the Lord's Christ until he had seen the Lord's Christ. The Bible doesn't tell us explicitly that Simeon is old, but it is implied throughout the text that he is he is waiting and he is prepared to depart. The idea that death seems fairly imminent is strongly implied. We find this man waiting. He's yearning. He's longing for comfort. Not that the, the kind of comfort that the world gives. Not the kind of peace that you find within the world, but the one that is bound up in the promise of God. 
one that you find and the good news that God is sending a savior into the world. Notice you do not find him grasping at what the world has to offer. You don't find him looking for, for fulfillment and the desires of the flesh. You don't find him thinking to himself, if I could just lay hold of this, then I'd be, be at peace. No, he's laid hold of God's word. He knows what he wants. He knows where satisfaction is going to be found. He's clinging to the promise of God, promise that includes consolation and peace and redemption and everlasting rest. And so what does he do in light of that? Well, he is ever looking upward. He is ever looking Godward, knowing that Yahweh alone is the source of his salvation. Simeon says to himself, I I have no other hope. I have no other trust, no other plea, no other confidence. And so my hope is set on God's salvation. Beloved, what are you looking at today? What is your hope set upon this very hour. What are you waiting for? If you could have one thing today, what would it be? At some point in walks Joseph and Mary into the temple complex and they are carrying the Lord Jesus in their arms. Simeon sees the child and he takes him up into his arms. There's some things that you'll let an older saint do that you won't let just any old stranger do. He takes this child up into his arms and he begins to bless the name of the Lord. In verse 29, we find uh, Simeon's hymn of praise and he begins to catalog the reasons he has to sing God's praises. Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. Church, do you understand how profound those words are? Do you understand how gloriously wonderful it is to be able to take these kinds of words to your lips? Young people, understand this, that when Simeon says, Lord, you're allowing your servant to depart, he's not talking about leaving the temple He's not talking about going back home. He's saying, I am now ready to die. I can depart this body. I can depart this world in peace. What a momentous thing that is. What a tremendous thing it is to be able to have that kind of solid hope guiding you through your life. Do you have it? What cause for rejoicing this is to know, to know that you can face death without fear. Death is a great, great enemy. The Bible calls it the last enemy and we have very good reason apart from the Lord Jesus Christ to fear death. The Bible says that it's appointed to man, unto man once to die and after that, the judgment. Brothers and sisters, are you prepared to face the judgment of God? Are you ready to depart in peace? Not because you are hanging on to empty platitudes, not because you are thinking to yourself, well, I'll be in a better place now, or I'll be at rest, or you have convinced yourself that somehow my, my, good, out, my good works will outweigh my, ba- my, my bad works, but because you know that your eyes, your spiritual eyes have seen the Savior. You have looked upon the Lord Jesus Christ with the eyes of faith, and so you have confidence. You can face death because Christ dwells within you. In Hebrews 2 and verse 14, it says that since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself, speaking of Jesus Christ, he himself likewise partook of the same things that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. What a contrast that is. 
lifelong slavery, slavery that comes through fear of death. And then you have, on the other hand, a servant of God ready to depart, to depart in peace. Where do you find yourself on that spectrum? Where do you find yourself today? God has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, the scripture says, so that we can say with Paul, O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Simeon says that this is a salvation that has been prepared. It's something that God has prepared for his people. That too is a wonderful expression. It, it reminds us that this is not a half-baked, a last-ditch attempt to save a people for himself. It is the result of plans formed in the eternal counsel of God. They are foreordained in eternity past, revealed to his people through promises and prophecies throughout many generations, and now they have come to fulfillment in the Lord Jesus Christ, the personal work of God's own son. Simeon says that it's done in the presence of all peoples. It's no small audience that God has in view here when it comes to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Isaiah says, the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. If you look at verse 32 in your Bible, Simeon makes an allusion there to Isaiah chapter 49. He talks about a light for revelation to the Gentiles. God promised he would make Israel a light for the nations so that his salvation would reach the ends of the earth. The saving purposes of God include all nations. They're for all peoples. You can look in this room today and see evidence of that. You see evidence, glorious evidence of the work of God and his grace that has reached all kinds of peoples today. They also mean glory to your people Israel. The glory of God comes both through and to Israel. In Romans chapter nine, Paul says to them, belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs and from their race, according to the flesh is the Christ who is God over all, blessed forever, amen. If you're familiar with the context there in Romans 9, you know that Paul is talking about what he describes there as the great sorrow and unceasing anguish that he experiences within his own heart over the fact that uh, his kinsmen, according to the flesh, the Jewish people have rejected the Messiah and he wishes himself a curse that they might receive the good news of Jesus Christ himself. They did not embrace the Messiah. They rejected Christ which is exactly where Simeon takes us. If you look at verse 34, this old man who is presumably on the brink of death, he is now ready to depart. He, he sounds this, this ominous note. And he turns to Mary and he says this, behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign that is opposed. Now, if you have been following along with us thus far, you know that up until this moment, the mood has been, been joyful. The tone has been exultant, jubilant, all the way through. There has been worship and praise and glory given to the Lord over the mercy and the grace that has been found in the birth of Jesus Christ and the fulfillment of God's promise. Well, suddenly Simeon interrupts that, that, that theme and he says, well, I want you to hear this as well. Not everyone is going to respond with that same kind of enthusiasm and warm embrace. Jesus is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel. His life is going to have a kind of twofold significance. 
And Simeon, again, he's drawing from, from the book of Isaiah in the eighth chapter here. In Isaiah chapter eight, uh, verses 14 and 15, it says that he will become a sanctuary and a stone of offense and a rock of stumbling to both houses of Israel, a trap and a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And many shall stumble on it, they shall fall and be broken. They shall be snared and taken. So Christ will come into the world and he will be on the one hand a sanctuary. He will be a place of security and rest. He will be a refuge and a hiding place. But brothers and sisters, it's the same God man who will prove to be for others the cause of their ruin, a trap and a snare. In Romans chapter nine, verse 33, it says, behold, I am laying in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, and everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. Both are true. I am laying in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. Some are going to fall. Some are going to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. They'll hear the message of Christ crucified and they'll stumble. The gospel will sound forth and they will take offense at its claims. They'll trip over what it says about, its, about their spiritual condition, about their souls, about their need, about the necessity of faith and repentance in the name of Jesus Christ. Now others will rise. They will say, yes, Christ is the one on whom I stand. He is my sure foundation. He is my cornerstone. He is the one on whom I trust. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in my eyes. I love the good news of Jesus Christ. Because of him, we will rise. Jesus Christ will be my vindication. In fact, it's the very same word here that, that uh, Luke uses for rise that is used elsewhere throughout the New Testament for resurrection. Others will rise. So Simeon has found the consolation of Israel, the very thing that he has been waiting for but he also anticipates that the Messiah is going to come and bring division, rising and falling, rejoicing and rejection, embrace and animosity. Jesus is a sign that it is opposed. When Paul was hauled uh, before the religious leaders, they said in effect to him, here's the, the little bit we know about uh, these followers of Jesus Christ, they said, with regard to this sect, we know that everywhere it's spoken against. That's what we know about those who follow Jesus Christ. It's spoken against. Wherever the good news of Jesus Christ goes forth, you're going to find this. It's going to be met. Brothers and sisters, young people, it will, go, it will be met with resistance with opposition, with rejection. One thing is for sure, there will be no neutrality. There will be no neutrality. Christ put it this way, he said, whoever is not with me is against me. And that is still true. That is still true today. It also helps us to be prepared as we think about going into a world that hates Jesus Christ. Some will reject him. But you know what, brothers and sisters, some will receive him. And when you encounter opposition, you encounter the hostility of the world, don't give up. Go on proclaiming the name of Jesus Christ because some will rise. Some will come to stand on him. Paul says, we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To one, a fragrance from death to, the, to death. To the other, a fragrance from life to life. It's a different image, but it's the very same principle. We carry the same aroma, but it provokes two very different reactions. Simeon adds this as well. He tells Mary, and a sword will pierce through your own soul also. It's a graphic picture. 
You may have heard before that there are, there are two words used in the New Testament for swords. One of them is a, a small dagger type sword. This isn't it. This is a very large, broad, a double-edged kind of sword that is going to pierce Mary's soul. What is Luke getting at there? Every mom loves to hear, you know, your son or your daughter is such a blessing. I love your son, your child. No one wants to hear, I hate your son. I can't stand being around your child. I hate what your child represents. Mary was going to have a front row seat to the hatred and the rejection, the sufferings and death her son was going to face. She was going to to witness firsthand her oldest son hanging on the tree for the sins of men. A sword would pierce her own soul. And beloved, I think there is an application here for us, not on the same level certainly as Mary, but I do think there is an application here in that to be identified with Christ, to see him with the eyes of faith and to put our trust in him, to follow after him, it is to know the power of his resurrection. It's to rise, but it is also to share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. It's to be hated by the world. And even at times to find ourselves grieving over the the, the hatred that you see uh, the Lord you love so much experiencing. You see the name of Jesus Christ being opposed and maligned. Simeon says that the net result of, of, coming, of the coming of Christ and this opposition that the message of the gospel is going to bring is that the, hearts from, or the thoughts from many hearts would be revealed. The proclamation of the gospel exposes the thoughts of hearts. You may have experienced this before. You may have been this person before. You may be this person right now someone who is perfectly content to talk about all manner of things. You may be someone who is content to discuss the deep things of life, uh, philosophy and truth and uh, the nature of things and all, all, everything conceivable under the sun. But when the gospel begins to be proclaimed, When the spiritual condition that we all face as sinners is pressed upon us, when we think about the prospect of standing before the judgment seat of God, you may find yourself experiencing a hostility rising up within an antagonism, an unwillingness to hear That is the secrets of the heart being revealed. It's the secret thoughts of the heart being exposed and brought forth. I have watched this happen more times than I can count uh, in my ministry. We can talk about a baby being born in Bethlehem. We can talk about the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, We can talk about the wonderful works of Jesus Christ, but when we begin taking up the theme of sin, when we begin talking about our desperate need of the cleansing blood of Jesus Christ, there will be some whose disposition suddenly changes or some who suddenly find themselves needing to use the restroom. The gospel exposes the thoughts of our hearts. Perhaps you experience that today, this visceral, sometimes even visible reaction as the sword of the word of God comes in to do its work, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. The Bible says, no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Jesus is a sign that's opposed 
so that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. And we have here inserted into all of the the glad songs and choruses that Luke has recorded for us, a kind of spiritual reality check, a heart check, one that invites us to, to ask ourselves, have we, have we stumbled or have we planted our feet on Jesus Christ? Have we taken offense or have we said, he is the one that I need? He's the answer to my greatest, deepest need. I have believed on him so that I may never be put to shame. I'm so thankful for the honesty of the scriptures. I'm so thankful that Luke puts it like it is for us. Maybe there is someone here today that would say, you know what, that's that's me. The condition of my soul is such that I don't want to hear this. I don't want to hear what the scripture says about me. Friend, confess that to God. Confess that to God for the sin that it is. Plead with him for a new heart and for a new spirit. Come today through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Ask him to sprinkle you clean of all your uncleannesses, even your unwillingness to come to him even your unbelief. Now look with me at Anna in verse 36. And there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was advanced in years, having lived with her husband seven years from when she was a virgin and then as a widow, until she was 84. If you assume that Anna was married by her mid-teenage years, which was the custom at this time, and she was married, as the scripture here says, for seven years, she would have been a widow by the time of her early 20s. It's difficult to know from the grammatical construction of this verse whether the 84 years that Paul talks about or that Luke talks about refers to how old she was at the time of this episode or it could possibly even be how long she had been a widow. But at minimum, she easily would have been a widow for 60 plus years by this time. And one may presume, I think that it's safe to say that her life had not gone the way that she had planned. In the Lord's providence, her early married years had been suddenly interrupted by the death of her husband. How could she go on? What would her future look like? What would she do with her time? Answer. She did not depart from the temple, worshiping with fasting and prayer night and day. She is the picture of godly piety. She spends her time with the Lord, seeking the face of God, praying, fasting night and day, Luke's description of her activity here seems to suggest the same spirit of expectation and anticipation that we see with Simeon. She's in the temple. She's, like Paul says, anxious about the things of the Lord. Anxious about the things of the Lord. She is a woman of prayer and fasting. One author says here, fasting constitutes a form of protest an assertion that all is not well. So you have this picture of a praying, fasting woman physically, spiritually depicting her hunger and her longing to see God satisfy her with the fullness of his promise. Confident of the very same thing that Mary said a couple of paragraphs back, that he fills the hungry with good things. 
And that very thing the Lord did, verse 38, and coming up at that very hour, she began to give thanks to God and to speak of him to all who were waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. Christ appears, she begins to worship, which in turn moves immediately into forth telling, evangelism, making Jesus Christ known to those who are around her. You have praise and proclamation. They both come together. Now, friends, where do you stand or fall? Where do you stand or fall today? Tozier said, what comes into our mind when we think about God is the most important thing about us. What has God revealed to you today about the secrets of your heart? And let's go to the Lord. Father in heaven, thank you for the gospel. Thank you for the good news of Jesus Christ. God, we praise your name for the consolation and the strong hope that we find in your son, uh, Lord, we are thankful that when we talk about the hope of the gospel, that we are not talking about an empty hope. We're not talking about something we have no basis to believe in, but that because of your faithfulness, because of Christ's finished work, we have a confident expectation that having believed on Jesus, we will not be put to shame. Lord, that while we wait for our for his return, that our light and momentary affliction is preparing for us even now an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. Lord, until then, though we have not seen him, we love him. Though we do not now see him, we believe in him and we rejoice with joy inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of our faith, the salvation of our souls. Lord, would you take your word and plant it deep within our hearts today? Minister to us, Lord. God, as we prepare to receive from your table, I pray that you would work in the hearts of your people. Lord, as we feed on the, the spiritual nourishment that you've given us in Christ, uh, that which is represented by uh, these elements, I, I ask that you would grant to us glad and sincere hearts. And we ask this in Jesus' name, amen.